The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or when you use our code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash the mom hour. Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us from preschool to teen. This is the show where we help you feel better about the mom you are and share our own parenting tips and personal stories. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the mom hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 110 of the Mom Hour. Hey, I don't have to say 10 and or try to figure out 106 anymore. Whatever. <laughs> We're back that was a track. real problem for me for a while. <laughs> I'm Megan Francis here, as always, with Sarah Powers. And today we're doing something we like to do every now and then, and that is take listener questions and then offer our, our humble advice, yes. such as it is. Yeah. Yes, our so, solicited advice. It's not unsolicited because that's people true. Exactly actually asked right. us questions. <laughs> right. We didn't make this up. People actually write us and ask those questions, and then we do our best um, to answer those questions honestly and, you know, carefully and, you know, helpfully. We'll yes. do our best. That's all we I do. can say. <laughs> we are welcoming our longtime sponsor, Prep Dish, back to the show today. And listeners, if you're looking to boost your protein intake, Prep Dish is making it so easy right now. When you sign up in January, you'll get access to a month's worth of the new Prep Dish Protein Boost Meal Plans. I love this, Sarah. Protein is so important for our health. It helps support mental clarity, sleep, energy, hormone balance, and more. And as busy moms, we're often not getting enough protein, especially at breakfast. With these meal plans from Prep Dish, you'll learn how to quickly prep four protein-rich dinners and one breakfast. Right. And like all Prep Dish meal plans, they make it so simple to shop once, prep for the week ahead of time, and save time on busy weeknights by having your meals ready to heat and serve. And Megan, these meals sound so delicious and perfect for January. Listen to this. Slow cooker carnitas bowls, stuffed pepper soup, and then there's a Swiss chard mushroom and goat cheese frittata for breakfast. Okay. I am adding that stuffed pepper soup to my rotation ASAP. This is a limited time offer, so make sure to sign up before the end of January to get your free bonus meal plans. To learn more and sign up now, visit prepdish.com slash the mom hour. Again, that's prepdish.com slash the mom hour for a month's worth of the new prep dish protein boost meal plans. Check it out. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies. But having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 Plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. All right, should we get into this? Let's get into this. So um, our first question comes from Marianne, and this is a really, I think, a timely one. We're, we're right in the middle of summer right now, but gosh, school starts earlier and earlier in a lot of places. And what I'm finding yeah. is a lot of people are getting their teacher and classroom assignments before yes. they even finish the prior school year. That's new to me. Do your kids get that? Like, do you no, know who our, your teachers our, will be next year? No, we won't get that for another month or so. Right. Um, yeah, so ours comes a little closer. But, you know, in Michigan, we don't start school until later than a lot of places, too. We don't right. even start till September. Right. So, yeah, we won't get our assignments till like, the end of 
you know, like mid to end of August. Well, so we have a while, but it's definitely on my mind already. Yeah, it's important. Definitely. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and read Marianne's question. Um, but again, I do think it's timely as we head into the next couple of months. This is going to be on a lot of people's minds. So she writes, have either of you ever requested that one of your kids be moved to a different class or teacher in school? My daughter will be entering second grade in the fall and so far has had two wonderful teachers and she really loves school. We have a great elementary school and principal, but there's one second grade teacher that has been there a long time who many of the parents at the school do not speak fondly of. Of course, that is the teacher my daughter got assigned for second grade. My personality is not typically one that would put up a stink and ask for a change, but I'm so worried that she's going to start not liking school this year if she doesn't have a good teacher. I'm hopeful that maybe others haven't liked her because she has high academic standards. I think I can deal with a teacher that is difficult academically, but I don't want a mean teacher. Have either of you had a similar situation? How would you handle it? Okay, I can answer this from a lot of personal experience. Great, go for <laughs> on it. Both, yes, on both sides. Okay, so the first thing I'll tell you, Marianne, is my, in my experience, the teacher that everyone else doesn't, you know, grumps about is not, you're not necessarily going to have that same experience. And that mm-hmm. happened to me four or five times with teachers who would, you know, the, oh, this is like the mean teacher, or this is the awful one. And and then my kids did fine in those mm-hmm. with those teachers. It was not a problem. So I've had it on both sides where it's like, I kind of had a little bit of nervousness or a little trepidation. And then my kid really clicked with that particular teacher. And for whatever reason, these other parents, uh, you know, didn't. And I think sometimes you have to consider the source. Sometimes I look at who's saying something and, and I wonder if their values are the same as mine. If what's important to them is the same as what's important to me. If their kids' personalities and mine are similar, like right. those are all things I like to think about while taking someone's opinion into account. However, I did have an experience on the other side where, um, I'm just going to say it because I'm sure she doesn't listen to my podcast. Clara <laughs> had a teacher at one point who I hadn't really heard much about because I didn't know many people who'd had her. And uh, she really had a tough year. And I'm not going to blame it on this teacher, but she had such a good year the year before. And she would say things to me like, why would they make school so great one year just to have it be so terrible the next year? And part of that is Claire's personality. She worries. She's very anxious. Um, She's really concerned about following the rules. And there were things that, you know, happened in the class that she just couldn't she really just couldn't relax in that mm-hmm. classroom. And I really went around and around because like you, Marianne, I'm not the type to make a stink. I usually just try to let things go and see if we can make it work. And it just wasn't. And so what I ended up doing, I didn't ask to change teachers because I, I, this was a few months in when I could see this was starting to happen. And I, I wasn't sure that that would be the right choice at that point. Um, but I did write an email to the principal and the school social worker and this mm-hmm. and the teacher and just said that, uh, Claire was having a hard time, and then we sat down with um, the social worker and the teacher and kind of talked about some strategies for making it better. And to be very honest, it didn't get a lot better. Like the the year ended kind of on a sour note, and so I was really proactive at the end of that year and went to um, the principal and the social worker and asked specifically that she be put in a very specific class the next year. And I kind of, the attitude I sort of had was like, look, I really took one for the team this year because at any point I could have raised a big stink and I didn't. And in retrospect, was that the right choice? I don't know. I mean, I think Claire's okay now. Like she got the teacher that she had heard from her brother was great. And she was convinced if she didn't get this teacher, her you know second grade year was going to be a disaster and then she got the teacher and has loved school ever since so a bad year a dip doesn't isn't something that can't be overcome but i think if you see it going south do something um yeah. I am the type who would let it play out, though, because like I said, with my other kids, I've definitely they've all had teacher assignments that other people have thought were bad ones and they've done absolutely fine. So you just don't know until you see that particular teacher and that yeah. particular kid together. I also had a weird experience where I had a teacher um, who had a wonderful reputation and then one year just her and it was Jacob just did not mesh. They were terrible. Mm-hmm. It was really bad. And I was like, what? why does she have such a good reputation? And then... Now, two of my other kids have had her, and it's been great. So I don't mm-hmm. know if she was just having a bad year, if they were just a really bad match. I have I don't know what happened. And yeah. you can't always, you can't always um, plan for that. I just stay on top of it, ask lots of questions, mm-hmm. and be proactive. If you don't, you know, if it doesn't really go well, but you don't think that yanking her or demanding a change is the right choice, there might be something else that you can do. So exhaust your options, but I wouldn't exhaust them all at the beginning. You know, I'd like pace them out a little bit. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And unless there's, um, okay, so I was thinking as you were talking and just what I could add to this, but it is interesting that they've gotten their assignment in the summer. And I think like (laughs) if my personality who likes to plan on the one hand, it would be so great to know what to expect all summer. On the other, now you have this less than ideal assignment and all summer to think and Oh yeah, exactly. How's that going to go? Yeah. So I'm going (laughs) to agree with you and say, excuse me, that I don't think I would request a change before the start of the school year or even really spend much time worrying about it for all the reasons that you said, Megan. Um, I love a couple of things that you said I want a second. And one is if you have a personality like yours and mine and Marianne's that isn't going to want to raise a stink, you're probably also a really supportive and involved school parent who is in general supportive of teachers. And this is something we've touched on quite a bit in this show. Um, I will say that that can border on accepting teachers' role kind of blindly. I know I'm someone who I always looked up to my teachers, and even as an adult and a parent, kind of almost give more authority than sometimes um, is appropriate because teachers yeah, are no, fallible. I know that Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. They're a teacher, so yeah. they must know what they're doing, and they've gone to school for this, and they Well, must do you have right. that thing where you can't call teachers by their first names? I mean, I have a real authority <laughs> complex when it comes to yeah. teachers, and I have a hard time seeing them as my peers, which is what they are. You know, they're in a professional environment, and, but they are my, my you know, partner, not just my... Like, and uh, just like ruler. Uh, right, exactly. And just like in any other profession, there are outstanding ones and there are marginal yeah. ones. And I think it's taken me a few years as a school parent to even be willing to admit that a teacher might not be great. And I know that sounds right. weird because there's so many parents who are quite critical of, of teachers and give them a hard time. And I almost think Marianne is probably more like you and me, where we err on the side of assuming if they've been hired and they've been there a long time, they must right. know what Somebody they're doing. Somebody better than them. So for me, it's <laughs> right. been actually a process to get to the point where I even admit that there are some crappy teachers. And you guys who are teachers out there, you know how supportive we are, but you also know in your own profession not, they're not all excellent. Now, having said that, right. we know that just like you said, Megan, we don't know about how this personality match up or how why the experience of people who've said that she's not that great, why that even happened. So I just want to say that it's OK to assert yourself or to even give yourself permission to say, you know what, I don't think this is a good fit. And then the things that you the action that you actually take, I think, Megan, you did a really good job of articulating that. So I won't add too much more. I will say, so we're at a school that's brand new was last year was its first year in existence. So there was quite a bit of, uh, just growth, new school growth. You know, there was a little bit of teacher turnover in the first few months. There will be quite a bit, I think between year one and year two. And, um, I really was very supportive of the administration and of the teachers we had. Um, Allegra's class had teacher turnover, a a brand new teacher in the first three months, and both classrooms had turnover with the assistant teacher. So I feel like, um, like you said, Megan, you didn't make it, you didn't cause a big deal when Clara had that one teacher. And I was the kind of, kind of the same way. I just kind of stayed the course. I didn't say that much. I, I kind of feel like that gives me a little bit more credibility for this upcoming year to say, you know, I'm really, it's really important to me that my kids get this teacher or this teacher or that they don't get this teacher. So it's almost like the more, the more, um, go with the flow and supportive of the school you can be to a point really does, I think, put you in, in the right place to then when it, when it is important enough to make a request, I do think the principal should hear They'll you. Take Does that make yeah, sense? And, and like I if think you're the do. parent who's always yeah. asking for a change yeah. or for a teacher request or for, you know, then, and you guys know who you are. Maybe that's you, maybe that's not. But we know there are parents like that who are at every turn, they're asserting that it's important that this X, Y, or Z happen. If you're not that person and, you know, you really are in general supportive of the administration and the school, that gets noticed. And then if it's time to say, you know what, this isn't working and this is important to me, I really do think that will be heard at a different yeah. level than if you're always that one parent. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's your currency for sure. Yes. Um, and that's what I was trying to say. You know, and 
the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but sometimes yeah. wheel, when wheels just squeak all the time, <laughs> yes. they don't sound so squeaky. Like yes. it sounds a lot squeakier when I, sp- I, I don't think anyone was really expecting me after having that many kids go through the school without with nary a, a peep, you know, yes. for me to step forward and say, Hey, this is just not working out. I think it was taken a little more seriously. Yeah. Um, and I had a long history in the school and then that's right. not going to be everyone's position. You can't just make that up. It doesn't just happen. So if, if it's your oldest and they're right. already having problems, it might just, it might take you getting in front of the principal and just being like, look, I'm not just, um, I'm not just griping just to gripe. Like, you know, this is what's happening and, and really kind of just like show your human side that this isn't just like you coming, um, down on this teacher, but this is you really having serious concerns for your child. And I think when I got in front of this, the social worker and was actually teary, like had a hard time keeping my voice steady. Mm -hmm. I think they took me very seriously because at school, the thing to remember is that at school, your child might be completely different than they are at home. So Mm -hmm. they kept saying, well, she's fine at school. She's fine. And I said, you know, she comes home and falls apart. You're not seeing it because she's holding it all together and then she's coming home. But let me, I'm, you know, when I tell you this, take me seriously, please. So, you know, so there's just, there's all kinds of factors, but, um, yeah, I think that's all really a good point, Sarah, that if you choose your battles wisely then you can fight them better and, people will maybe listen to you a little bit. They'll just give it a little more credence, what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think it sounds like Marianne's, I I don't know this for sure, but I got the impression this is her oldest child. So second grade is just a couple of years into being a school mom. And I just feel like like everything else, it gets a little easier and you just feel a little more confident in where what to do with all this stuff yep i totally agree you know you see you start to see that one year never doesn't usually make or break anything anyway and one teacher isn't going to make or break anything but you also get more confident yeah in in figuring out what does matter and then speaking up about it so can i say one more thing about principals because this is um being at a smaller school and a new school um, I had so much more contact with our principal this past year than I did in my whatever I'd had three years at a couple of other elementary schools before that. And um, just like we say, teachers are people too. Principals are actually people too, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, and I really enjoyed getting to know our principal. I think I was so intimidated by principals. We were at really big schools, so they just seemed so busy, like they would never know who I was. But along the same lines of choosing your battles, um, if there's something positive you ever wanted to say about a teacher or a program or the school, you can shoot the principal an email. You can ask the front office if it's not a public email address. Um, I feel like that is a relationship that's harder to build. But Megan, I'm sure you know, like having been at schools for years and years and years, it is actually a relationship that is worth building. And um, just like we said, that if, if you have sort of put in a little effort to get to know the principal or to share when something is going well. Like any leader, they always hear about the stuff that's not going well. They very seldom hear about, you know, what is going well. So it's, right. I think that's worth putting a little attention into. I've really enjoyed getting to know our principal and um, it, it can, not that this is the reason you do it, but it would pay off if it were time to have a serious conversation. They'd know who you are and they'd take you seriously. Absolutely. Yep. All good. Good stuff. All right. Okay. Can we read the next one? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, This one is from uh, Dania, and this is a question about physical fitness and health. And and I I love this because we don't feel like we address this as much as we could necessarily. Yeah, I agree. After a while, it's like, what more more is there to say except take care of yourself as best you can and you can't be good to yourself. But there is more to say. Yeah, I like the way she asks this question. Can I also really say that Dania is um, an American living in Milan? Oh, Uh, I do. We hear from international international people. Yeah, yeah. She's um, from the U.S., but living in Milan right now with a one-year-old. Well, then I'll imagine her in some, you know, exotic... uh, I don't know, poolside situation (laughs) while she's typing this With models surrounding Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, so here's a question from Dania. How have you achieved your personal balance between empowering yourself to meet your fitness and health goals, if any, and loving your new, wonderful, life-giving body? She says she loved her episode on postpartum bodies, just interested in tying that to fitness specifically, and we should throw out a a call-out to that. What was that episode number? Do you remember? I don't know the episode number, but... um... If we'll you just link go to it type, in the show notes. Yeah, we'll link yeah. to it. And if link, you go to the mom type hour, postpartum, type into postpartum the, yeah. it'll come up. Um, I'd be curious to hear your process to find your place of balance. Everything from the mental aspects of considering your needs and priorities and examining your thought space to the practical aspects of scheduling and child care to make things happen. Has your balance or approach changed at all through subsequent pregnancies and the adjustment of additional children? 
I feel like I'm just settling into a routine after that I'm happy with after many months of trying different things. It would be great to hear your experiences and thoughts. Now, first of all, I will say that is a big topic. Yeah. <laughs> it were, you know, that's why we did a whole episode on it. Um, but I like that she's I th- asking, I think, I think most specifically about fitness routines and finding the balance between accepting that maybe you're not going to get back to your pre-baby yeah. body, but a fitness routine is still an important part of self-care. That's sort of yeah, like absolutely. what yeah, I'm Yeah, I totally from this. see it. Yes. Um, so I guess, Sarah, do you want to tackle sure. this first? Yeah, okay, I'll, go ahead. I'll start. And I feel like longtime listeners, you've probably heard us talk about this in different ways on different shows, but I, I didn't have any kind of a fitness routine until I can tell you exactly when we joined our gym after moving to California, which was like two, a little over two years ago, but my oldest is nine. So for like basically seven years... I went to an occasional yoga class. I I was so active running up and down stairs and chasing small children that I didn't have one. Um, I didn't struggle with my weight, although Don't I forget did. about breastfeeding. Yeah, breastfeeding. Yeah, <laughs> Eating not sleep- five hundred calories a day. Yeah, I mean, and not you know. sleeping, not having any reserve energy. Now I don't recommend that. Um, I think. <laughs> You know, I really don't. But I had three kids in five years. Um, We didn't have a gym membership at that time. I lived in Arizona where half the year it was prohibitively hot to be, you know, to go for a quick run. But I'm still not saying that's a good way. I'm just saying that if if that's you and you're in that season, someday you may have a regular fitness routine. Um, I did have lower back problems that I've had since my early 20s that would flare up every once in a while. And my lower back flare-ups are directly related to being strong in my core. Now, that doesn't mean I have to be at Pilates every day. It just means if if I'm sitting for a long period of time or doing a lot of unhealthy bending and straightening, like picking stuff off the floor, maybe you, you know, do that when you have small children. Um, So I would have those back flare-ups, like maybe two or three times a year, pretty bad, like having to lie down for a couple days and just, you know, having to cancel everything, you know, pretty bad. Um, I will say now that I have a regular, very light, regular fitness routine, my back is amazingly good. So that's, that's a direct correlation. Um, in terms of finding, finding the balance between not being too hard on yourself, but also making fitness a priority. Um, for me, I think the easiest thing is to lower the standard of what, daily fitness looks like. So in other words, if I'm okay with a 25 minute walk, I'm more likely to do that four or five days a week than expecting myself to go to a 90 minute yoga class that's only offered these three days and I've got to get to it all three days. So um, that to me is more helpful. Now I will say, I feel like I'm entering a time where I kind of miss the feeling of being really sweaty and really exhausted. And like, that was like a hardcore workout. And I haven't really wanted that in a long time, but it's because I'm more rested now. Like Mm. I'm my fitness level in general is better than it was a few years ago because I do do regular walking or light weights or whatever. So I don't know. Does that kind of set the stage for you? I feel like you have a longer time period to kind of talk about um, (laughs) how this has played out for you. Well, this has gone up and down a lot for me. So um, where I am now, I'm the heaviest I've ever been, you know, outside of pregnant or newly postpartum. Um, I'm also starting to find myself being okay with that. And I think there's like, there is a struggle because part of me is like, oh, if I could just like shave off five pounds, all of my clothes would fit better and I would just feel better. Like I just, there's things that I can already tell, like aren't more difficult necessarily. I'm just not as comfortable in my clothes. It's like, Mm -hmm. they're just, they're tight (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I don't want to go up a size because then they're going to be loose. And I'm like in this weird little in between spot right now. Um, So it's not like I never think, you know, gosh, I'd like to be more fit or I'd like to be a little thinner or something like that. Um, But I'm also, you know, I think there was a long period of time. I had kids really young. So at any time I theoretically could pass like for a person who was, really young without kids even Mm -hmm. into my mid-30s people would mistake me for being in my late 20s all the time mid-20s even and being thin helped and so there was always this feeling like maybe if I if I just maintain this um you know maybe I can be the best shape of my life this year or maybe I can maintain this and I can just keep like passing for this age and I'm kind of at the point now where I'm like eh do I need to pass anymore? I mean, do I'm not trying to pull off anything that I'm, I'm not trying to look 10 years younger. I'm not trying to be anything I'm not. I just kind of have to get comfortable with the body Mm -hmm. that I'm in. 
Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment. (laughs) Right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar, they have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them, and I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash mom hour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Now, how do I balance that with wanting to be healthy? That's the challenge. And Mm -hmm. I think I think where that has to be. And this is something I logically knew in my 20s and logically knew in my 30s, but was been really hard for me to accept until quite recently is like figuring out what am I doing it for in the first place? Am I doing it because I want to have a hot bod? Mm -hmm. That's different than (laughs) if I because I'd probably be doing different stuff. Like if I just wanted to be if I wanted to drop two dress sizes and um, and look great in, you know, like booty shorts, right? (laughs) Then I'd probably honestly hardly be eating using like supplement shakes. At this point in my life, this is the kind of stuff I'd need to do. My metabolism is not where it was, right? Right. I'd have to like give up wine. I'd have to work out daily and it would have to be like hard, sweaty workout, not just a couple, you know, walking around the, you know, walking 20 minutes or whatever. So I'm trying to reestablish what is it? What is the reason I'm doing it? And I think the reasons I'm looking at now are I want to feel strong. I want to be flexible. That's mm-hmm. something that I underestimate sometimes. Like when I haven't gone to yoga for a while and everything hurts and is tight mm-hmm. and that can happen pretty quickly. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't take that long to yeah. tighten up. Um, so being strong and flexible is, are really important to me and having some stamina mm-hmm. is really important to me mm-hmm. and looking good is like fifth on the list. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's like, it's important, but it's not, it doesn't trump everything else. And so, You know, what else is also important to me is enjoying myself and Mm -hmm. having time to spend doing things that I want to do, not just Mm -hmm. things that I do because I'm trying to force myself into a smaller pair of jeans or whatever. So um, I guess that's where I am. And like with what you said, Sarah, is if you know you can meet those goals, I mean, I could meet those goals if I walked four days a week for 25 minutes and went to two yoga classes a week, I would Mm -hmm. feel good. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Now, if I want to look a little bit better, I'm going to have to add on maybe a strength training class. Right. And maybe one of those 25 minute walks is going to have to be a run and something yeah. like that. And maybe I'm going to have to be more careful about what I eat. And that's where that balance is. Because yes. the, the walking in a couple of yoga classes is easy for me. I've, it's it's right. part of my routine now. Um, my kids are older. It's easier. I yeah. joined a yoga studio that has classes all the time. That really helps. Mm-hmm. Um but it's like, I guess now I'm in that position where I just have to, like, almost like every choice I make, like, so does this, is this worth, <laughs> is looking a little bit better or dropping a yeah. few pounds worth that trade off? And I feel like I change my mind on that daily. Like, it doesn't go away. It's just less present. It's not so close to the surface for yeah. me anymore as it was for a while. No, I think that's, um, I think that's super helpful. I also think, um, just going back a little bit to Dania's question, I think in her email she said her daughter's 13 months, and she's also asked about subsequent pregnancies and future children. So yeah. thinking back to you know those years where you know your body's going to change, it's easy to get into this feeling of like, why bother? What's the point? <laughs> why right. bother if I'm going to be pregnant again in six months? Like, what's the point? And I think a lot of what you just said even though you're approaching it as being very done with children and, you know, having more years behind you um, in yeah. of those pregnancy and stuff. Um, it's kind of the same thing, which is why what's important at this time? Is it to have the energy to keep up with, with my toddler? Is it to have the mental health benefits of a little bit of exercise every day? Is it to if you do struggle with weight gain, is it to keep yourself at a healthy weight so that a future pregnancy comes at a healthy weight instead of starting overweight, you know? So I think looking at that um, and just just expanding it so that it isn't just about size. And we talked a lot about that, I think, in our postpartum episode. The other thing yeah. I want to say that you and I, neither of us train for things or do nope. <laughs> like boot camp challenges, but that's not to say that that isn't um, an option if you feel like you need some external accountability or also if you feel like you want some social aspects. So I know the Stroller Strides, which is now called Fit for Mom, there's um, those programs probably not in Milan, but in so many U.S. cities. Um, and having that, having a community that's a little bit social in addition to the fitness aspect, I think is so motivating for a lot of people. And just because you and I haven't gone that route, I, I don't want to skip that. Um, yeah. And then the, and I, I can even link to that because there's, there's, um, fit for mom um, communities in so many, so many places. Um, So if you haven't, and that is, if you're not familiar, it's, um, it's resistance and cardio and strength training using your stroller and your baby. So you don't need childcare. Um, And then finally, I just got an Apple watch. I was never um, into the Fitbit thing, but any kind of tracking, whether it's just in your journal or if you use a Fitbit or an Apple watch, um, I think anytime we're aware of our patterns, um, it can inspire some just small incremental healthy changes. And that's with everything from, I mean, these with apps and stuff. I mean, you can track everything from how much water you're drinking to how well you're sleeping to, you know, your movement and exercise goals. So um, I think that's another way to just if if you want to be balanced, which I think is what Dania is asking, if you want to be moderate and balanced about mm-hmm. this and be forgiving and accepting of yourself while still keeping an eye on basic fitness, I think some of those things can can help, whether it's an old fashioned journal log or something like a Fitbit or I it's kind of fun on my Apple watch to see, you know, to put it on when I go for a walk and see, you know, see that activity tracked in that way. So those are great suggestions. And I think one other thing that I would add, and I think this becomes really important when you have limited time, um, when you know, you're not like you said, you know, you're going to be pregnant again anyway, so you're not going to necessarily get a, a visible result that you want. Um, it's to do, do stuff you love, and they say that, yeah. and it sounds, and man, I went back and forth with myself about this, like, but I don't like to exercise, so I don't <laughs> like any of it. But the truth is, I love hiking. I love mm-hmm. kayaking. I love stuff that ha- is outdoors. I really enjoy yoga, even when I go to a class where I kind of want to kick myself halfway through. I know yeah. you've all been to the class before, where you're like, <laughs> on your 30th, you know, um, Chaturanga, and you're like, why? Why? You try not to look at the clock if why? there is one. I'm like, yes, don't look exactly. at the clock because I'm going to be so disappointed exactly. if it's only half over. But I always feel so good at the end that I'm glad I did it. And then there are other exercise classes I've been to where I don't feel good at the end and I'm not glad I did it. And mm-hmm. I don't want to go back. And I really 
have gone up and down trying to force myself into something I don't enjoy. Uh, and it doesn't, it'll, maybe you'll get a couple of months, but it's not going to last. Mm-hmm. And yo-yoing is no good and being all over the place is, it, we all know this. It's not, that's not how you create lifestyle changes that last. It doesn't mean you stick to the same workout for the rest of your life. You need to mix things up. But I just, I do think there are, um, I do think you have to kind of do what you love and, and find ways within to jazz it up a little bit. Like, for example, you know, we, we've both talked about how we don't train for things. Like, I, don't, yeah. I would probably, I just don't see myself ever doing a, a 5K or 10K unless I, like, walked it just for fun. I wouldn't train yeah. for it. Yeah. But I was thinking to myself, if I wanted to get really good at, like, rowing or something, mm-hmm. I could see myself doing that because I enjoy yeah. it. So it's a little bit different. So maybe there's something competitive or social that you could do that's not the typical running race yeah. or not the typical thing that you hear about or yeah. I don't know isn't a kickboxing class or whatever yeah. um, be, be uh, take, take the time to think about what that might be try some different things when you can and just keep in mind like you said I, I really think that the main thing is why am I doing this in the first place yeah. and if you keep the why in your head you'll figure out the how and more lower easily. the bar lower the if the bar is so high that you're not doing anything lower the bar because yeah. that's that all or nothing mentality is easy to get into and yeah. if you know like just one last quick tip if you're a lot of moms walk a lot anyway depending on where you live and like what your daily lifestyle is i i find something sometimes just putting on workout type clothes and saying this is my exercise for the day. Even if you're just walking to the same park with your little one that you go to every day, yeah. you know, you maybe you pick up the pace. Maybe you drink a little mo- more water when you're done. I mean, there's there's such subtle mind sh- mindset shifts that can, I think, help, help. Yeah. So, so for me, like I'm growing my hair out. If I get up in the morning and put my hair in a ponytail, I am more likely to go for a good walk. It's just <laughs> this dumb little thing. But like, I'll be like, well, my hair's already up. I might as well go. You, there's lots, especially when you have little kids and like yeah. everything is a big ordeal and yeah. everything is a production. Yeah. Having your pants already on that you can walk <laughs> in or having your hair up. I mean, it just, it sounds dumb, but it's like one less obstacle. Yeah. So make it really easy on yourself too, as much as you can. And if you're a stay at home mom, that's, you know, you can just live in athleisure wear. Yeah. Yep. So do it. Yep. <laughs> that's why, that's why moms do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Well, hopefully that helped. Um, and yeah, I loved that question. Great, great um, continuation of some of the others talking we've done about that. So All right, well, I will set up this last question for today. And this comes from Janine, and we're going to play Janine asking her question. She sent it in, in audio format, which you can do anytime. Um, most fo- most smartphones just have a voice recorder. You can just record yourself asking a question and email us that audio file to hello at themomhour.com, which is what Janine did. So I'm just going to go ahead and play her question now. Hello, my name is Janine, and I have two little girls, ages three and three months. And I was wondering how you deal with anxiety related to your kids' physical safety and well-being. I see a lot of news stories and hear stories of tragic accidents and kids getting hurt in car accidents or falling downstairs or falling out of windows. Um, I watch my girls very closely, but I just have this great fear that something really bad is going to happen to them. And I feel like we don't do a lot of things or go a lot of places because of that fear, um, because I know what could happen and I don't want it to. So I don't know how much this is because my girls are young or if it's just part of being a mom. Um, So I was just wondering if you've dealt with this and how you have handled it and how you make sure that you still let them live um, and experience life even if situations might be scary or have something bad could happen. Um, Just how you dealt with that. Thanks. Okay, Janine, I just want to tell you that um, if you listen to the show for any length of time, you probably know that I am fairly relaxed, but even I had a lot of weird, and mine were like weird worries (laughs) when my kids were really little, especially. Mm -hmm. And my sister and I, who's also, my sister's very relaxed as well, has talked about this, how her, one of her big worries, like she would have anxiety attacks, imagining one of her kids crawling into an abandoned refrigerator. Wow, that's um, really specific. Super specific. And how many places do you even see abandoned refrigerators? But right. I had similar weird things that I would get really worried about that weren't even in, within the realm of reality. And I think that's so easy to do when they're little and helpless and you're like literally keeping them alive every day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and it's a huge job. Um, and I think that's pr- that's normal like to have those worries is normal and I think for myself the place that I would want to start and Sarah you could probably speak to this better than me just being someone I think who probably worried about real things yeah (laughs) 
<laughs> more than me. No, and I think um, I think we all know that I worry more than you do in general yeah, as a yeah. personality trait. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that the 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 thing that has always helped me is to understand relative risk. Yes. So oh yes, things like car seat, like a car seat um, situation, has always been way more important to me than something like uh, a child falling off of um, you know a toddler slide mm-hmm. because those are built with extreme safety standards. They're mm-hmm. built for toddlers. Like there's just, you know, you really look at things side by side and you look at the relative risk of those two, of those two things. It's pretty easy to start seeing that a lot of injuries that you hear about are outliers. Um, yes. I also want to talk about the 24 hour news cycle. Yes, please. <laughs> and that is, you know, basically we have these 24 hour news stations that have to have something to put on the airwaves. Mm-hmm. And so when something um, really bad and weird and unusual happens. It almost seems like it happens more. Like it gets Absolutely. more. It gets more uh, play. It gets more people talking about it. Did you know this? Did you like? I never thought about it, but oh my gosh, I'm so lucky. Like I've heard parents say things like, you know, I just feel so fortunate that that's never happened to my kid. And you're like, well, actually, the the flip side is true. Yeah. Like the other person was extremely, like incredibly yeah. unfortunate. It's not like we're lucky that our kids are alive. It's basically that anybody who's has something really bad happen is on the other side, like extremely unlucky. So I think sometimes like looking at it that way can help a little bit. Yeah. What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I have lots to say about this. Um, first of all, Janine has a three year old and a three month old, which in my mind is tells me you're getting used to this idea of having two kids, which is like mm-hmm. a huge world shift. A three-year-old is getting much more independent and possibly more brave, and you're no longer able to protect, quote-unquote protect. I'm not sure we can ever completely protect right. our kids from this stuff, but you're having to let go a little bit of being able to protect the first child because now you have also your attention's divided. You have this new baby. Um, I think... It's really natural to worry. Um, The part of Janine's question that I want to talk about a little bit is saying that she finds that they're not going out and doing things because of this worry. And as someone who has dealt with worry and anxiety, that to me is the point at which, not like I'm not being an alarmist, but it's the point at which it's worth examining where is this worry coming from and what help do I need right-sizing it, like you said, with relative risk? And by help, I don't mean meds or therapy necessarily. I mean, what what can change about the information I'm taking in and the people I'm surrounding myself with so that caution can be part of how I parent, but worry is not dominating. Worry is not keeping me home with a new baby and a toddler. Um, Because that's the point at which I feel like Janine's not going to enjoy and experience this time the way she might otherwise. Yeah. So I yeah, have a few, I a few ideas on that. One is reducing, like you said, the number of alarming news stories that are coming in. Um, I think the click, so you mentioned the 24-hour news cycle, the the print side of that, or the, I guess you would call it the web, the digital side of that. Yes, the Facebook side of that. The Facebook (laughs) side of that is that news outlets and websites make money when people click on their links. So just like you said, Megan, there is, there is a corporate strategy behind alarming you and getting you to click on those links. And you do not have to accept that. And um, I I would venture a guess that Janine has enough safety information as a mom of two young kids to not need to look at any of that for a while. Um, you're not going to miss anything. Like if there's a product safety recall or something that um, safety experts change their mind about, your pediatrician will let you know or your friends will let you know. Mm-hmm. I would take I would take a scorched earth um, approach to really re-examining what you're reading and clicking because that is such a contributor to this. Um, I had my b- babies in Arizona um, where pool safety and drowning is a huge. I mean, there are there's drowning stories like literally every day in the news, and it is it it's it can be all consuming that concern. Yeah. Um, I don't think I don't know that that's gonna magically fix everything, but I think it's a huge contributor. The other things that I think can positively help how you are able to kind of 
I don't know, contextualize this worry, right size it maybe is what I mean, is um, take a look at the people you're hanging out with and the types of families. Um, as someone who is a worrier, I benefit hugely from being around people who don't worry. Like, I mean, Megan, mm. you and I, like just even whether it's in our business or like with our kids, I really benefit from being around people whose overall personalities are just a little less anxiety prone than mine. Mm. I also think if you are hanging out with parents who have multiple kids who are a little bit older than yours and just seeing firsthand, what is it like when somebody breaks their arm? What's it like if somebody falls off a trampoline? What happens if, you know, God forbid, you lose track of your kid on the pool steps for a second, they go under and someone has to fish them out. I, I mean, honestly, it sounds it sounds like a little bit of exposure therapy. And I think I think that's what it is in <laughs> yeah. a way. It's it's being instead of seeing things on the news, it's sort of um, coming to terms with that. These small incidents and accidents happen in everyday parenting life. And the worst case scenario, the awful, awful scenarios that we hear about on the news are, like you said, Megan, they're the most extreme and rare cases. And in fact, we have many close calls. Like I have had, okay, let me list a couple. I have had a kid fall all the way down a flight of stairs in our Arizona house. We had, it didn't have a landing. So it was one full flight of stairs from the second floor. It was carpeted. Carpeted, but it was long and it was steep. And I had one, probably two year old, fall all the way down, hit a nasty bump on his forehead. And I look, I watched him carefully for signs of any other concussion, and he was fine. Um, I have had that moment where I've been in a pool with a bunch of moms and little babies, and someone was holding one of them, and they kind of wiggled away. And for a second, it was that like horrible moment for a second right. where we looked around and fished a toddler up from the bottom. Um, and again, we we were really we were cautious, and we made sure that there was no secondary drowning, and we took all the precautions. But it was okay. Um, I've had a kid break a arm in a bounce house. I've had a kid break an arm at a summer camp. I feel like the more small accidents and incidents that you have either in your own family or your friends, the more uh, normal is not they kind of inoculate word. you. <laughs> yeah. yeah nor- it, it's, it's that, okay, these are things that are part of childhood and yes. they're not fun. They can be really scary and I don't want to diminish that, but they are not all the things that you see on the news. They're actually yeah. much more um, kind of every day than that. And yeah. um, if you haven't had anything like that happen and you're really isolating yourself at home or you're only hanging around with other moms with similarly aged children who haven't yet gotten hurt, um, it just it's so easy to go to the worst place scenario in your mind. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? And oh. and you know what? Uh, like and, and this again, hopefully this doesn't cause more anxiety because <laughs> that's totally not my intent. But I'm just, look, while you're describing these things, um, Sarah, I'm thinking of two things that happened in my house. I accidentally whacked my like two month old baby's head into a door frame oh, because yes. I was just, you know how you're like walking yeah. fast and I just, t- I turned or something and whacked his head really hard. My sister-in-law fell up the stairs <gasps> at my house holding her baby and like yeah. he catapulted out of her arms, like flew across yeah. the room and hit a wall. I mean, <laughs> this stuff happens like people Babies are human. fall off the changing table and off the bed. Right. I forgot about those. We're clumsy, you know, we're kind of yeah. clumsy and, and babies are slippery sometimes and wiggly and things happen and it's like, you, you can't always predict for it. You can't. It's and I don't want to say like, I know you can't. I'm really glad that you weighed in because for me, my response is just to kind of like, OK, it's not happening. Like kind of, you know, just make it go away in my head, which I right. think I'm just better at than yeah. some people. Yeah. Um, it's just a skill of mine. But I do think that, you know, if if you try to control for all possibilities and potentialities, you do end up kind of locking yourself, like painting yourself into a corner. Yeah. And and. And I think that as your kids get older and they're going to need, and we've talked about this like in our free range episode and stuff, they, they need to learn how to calculate risk. Yes. And all these little things that happen to them when they're little help them do that as they get older. Cause the last right. thing you want is to protect them so much that then the first time they walk to school by themselves, they just can't handle it or they yeah. don't know how to get there or they're yeah. afraid to cross the street or whatever it is. Like, being comfortable with a certain amount of risk and being able to assess risk makes us safer. Yes. Um, oh, and I, that is yeah. a learned thing. It's like a, that's like a tweetable link. I mean, that's oh, it is. Phrase. I wish I remembered exactly what I said. I'll have to go um, back and listen Yes, to we'll again. transcribe that one. <laughs> yeah. um, but Janine, also, you know, surround yourself with moms of all different kinds. I, that's something, it's like one of Sarah's mantras on this show. Um, being around families and community of all different kinds is so, so helpful, I think, both for the two reasons I said. One, you'll see moms who are really 
laid back about safety stuff, maybe to the point where you're almost judging them and you're like, right. why isn't her kid wearing a helmet? I, I have had that judgment myself sometimes. But the the wide spectrum of where people fall on how they protect their kids and observe safety precautions, I think, is actually really good to see. Because if you only rely on like the printed warnings on packaging, which is like the scariest, or the clickbaity headlines, it just seems like you're never supposed to leave your house. When, right. in fact, there are families out there, you know, scraping their knees and swinging from the monkey bars and going on trampolines all the time. And I think um, the real world is more comforting than what we are, what we're given in the media. So I don't know if that kind of wraps that one up. But I think that totally wraps um, that one up. I just also have to say it is not easy to admit that you are experiencing worry of that nature. And so I really appreciate that particular question. And also, I know that for every Janine, there are listeners that we have that are not comfortable saying publicly on a podcast that they're struggling with worry or anxiety. So thank you. You probably helped somebody. Um, And if it feels like this worry is dominating too much, talk to your doctor or your pediatrician, either one about, you know, whether this is like in the range of normal. So absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Janine. Was that it for this episode? I I think think so. So So we actually collected a whole bunch of listener questions recently. So I think we should do another one of these soon um, because we have some. So if you sent us a question and we didn't take it today, um, it's not like it doesn't go into the, what do you call it in writing? We didn't throw it away. pile or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) What is it? I think, what do they call it when like they, on the cutting room floor? Yeah. 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 It didn't like, it didn't get rejected. (laughs) We just started with. We haven't got to it yet. And we'll do some more. Um, before we wrap, just a quick reminder that you can get your Kind Snacks variety pack for $10, and that includes free shipping by going to kindsnacks.com slash themomhour and try all those yummy, healthy snacks for yourself that we talked about at the top of the show. Um, anything we talked about here will be at themomhour.com. This is episode 110, and we will be back with you next week. See you then. Hi friends, Megan here. I wanted to let you know about a new podcast I've just launched called The Teas Made. Think of it as a weekly cozy conversation with me over your favorite hot beverage on topics like wellness, creativity, family, hospitality, and more. Just look for The Teas Made with Megan Francis wherever you get your podcasts or head to theteasmade.com to find all those episodes. The Teas Made is your reminder to take a little break from the busyness of life. So come on in and get comfy. The Teas Made. Hey everyone, Sarah here. Megan and I would absolutely love it if you hit pause right now, right where you're listening, and left the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, that's one of the absolute biggest ways you can thank us. And it really takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, just navigate to the Mom Hour's show listing. So not the episode you're listening to right now, but the kind of landing area for our show as a whole, and then scroll down to leave a rating or review. Thank you so much.